Think back to your childhood and the joy of having your own birthday cake. Maybe it was your mom or your grandmother that decided they'd make a birthday cake for you from scratch. No Betty Crocker or Duncan Hines mix for you on your birthday. No way, no how. She'd go to her index card file box, pull out a yellowed handwritten recipe, assemble the ingredients, and begin mixing as you anxiously waited. You look forward not only to the finished product from the oven, but something else, the beaters. You'd lick and lap like there was no tomorrow. After that, you'd run your fingers along the inside of the mixing bowl and get every last bit of that sweet, yummy batter. Now, you might reasonably ask, what does a birthday cake have to do with being in God's presence? Well, there are telltale signs and unmistakable indicators of being in God's presence. You might think of those indicators as essential ingredients for baking a birthday cake. Each ingredient is important, and if you follow the recipe, you'll bake a surefire, no-fail, guaranteed, light and fluffy, blue ribbon cake that would do your grandma proud. Birthday cake recipes and our reading from Nehemiah have a lot in common. Let's take a look. The first ingredient, the primary component, in fact, is people. People make up the bulk of God's birthday cake presence. We see the primacy of people from these words from Nehemiah 8.1. All the people gathered together in the square before the water gate. Before you have anything else, you must have people gathered together. Before there was ever a Bible written down, God was already interacting with people. People like Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, Deborah and Samson, Saul and David, the prophets, and many others. Before biblical writers ever put ink to parchment, they told stories of God's interaction with people throughout history. And here in our reading from Nehemiah, we see another interaction of God with people. The gathering of the people of Israel in Nehemiah is indicative of one crucial element of being in God's presence. Being among other people. A religion of one is a religion of none. Because we are made to be with others before the Lord. You need others to worship God because on our own, we're apt to forget about grace when we've lost our job or a spouse or are battling addiction. We need the support that others give us to make it through life, a faith community that stands shoulder to shoulder with us when our shoulders are sagging. Prior to anything else, the primary ingredient for being in God's presence is people. As such, let's designate people as flower. The first ingredient of being in God's presence. And this flower is not self-rising. It needs God's help to rise. It's all-purpose flower. And we need to be an all-purpose church. Worshiping, teaching, evangelizing, fellowshipping, and outreaching. God needs all-purpose churches to reach all kinds of people. All-purpose people and flower is the first ingredient. Our second ingredient is hearing and interpretation. Hearing and interpretation make up the second component of our cake of being in God's presence. Nehemiah 8, 3 and 8 says, the ears of all people were attentive. The Levites 
gave the interpretation. The people who were gathered there wanted to hear what Ezra had to say. Their ears were attentive because God's law given to Moses had been unheard for over 70 years. Ezra and the people of God had returned from exile in Babylon where they'd been taken captive and not allowed to return to their homeland. After 70 years, they're free to practice their faith unhindered, but most of the people are more than a little fuzzy about what exactly God wants. So they ask Ezra to tell them. They've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, and now they want to rebuild their lives of faith. Their ears were attentive, but the language of the Bible was Hebrew that Ezra was speaking, and the common language of the people was Aramaic. So it wasn't enough for their ears to be attentive. They needed interpretation. Someone to translate and interpret what they were hearing so they could hear what God had to say. This is what the Levites were doing, working their way through the crowd. Ezra would read, and the Levites would translate and interpret it so that others could truly hear it. What this means for us is that it's not enough to have the Word of God. Our ears must be attentive, and there must be interpretation to our lives and times. We don't need, thankfully, to hear it in the original Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek to get it. There are many wonderful translations and versions of the Bible that convey the message of God to people. Hearing and interpretation are necessary in our lives and give us our second ingredient. Recognizing that hearing and interpretation are two sides of one coin, the ingredient for this is double-acting baking powder. The double action of hearing and interpretation gives rise to further insights. Leavening is needed to make the dough rise in the mixing bowl and in the oven. Double-acting baking powder of hearing and interpretation is our second ingredient. Our third ingredient is understanding. Understanding is the next component of being in God's presence. Nehemiah 8.2 says, Ezra brought the law before the assembly, all who could hear with understanding. Those who were assembled there were men and women, and this group also included those who could understand as well, which at that time was considered to be the age of seven. Seven-year-olds were gathered with parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents as Ezra spoke the words of God. Because finally it's not enough to hear the word or even to have it interpreted. It must be understood. To understand is to stand under, to be under the authority of something greater than oneself. The goal of being in God's presence, as Ezra reminded the people, was for them to understand, to stand under God's authority once more. In Babylon, they hadn't been allowed to stand under God, for the kings of Babylon had coerced the people to stand under their idols. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had refused to understand the idols and were tossed into a fiery furnace. Daniel refused to worship the king and was thrown into a den of lions. The understanding of the people had been tested in Babylon and their minds confused by whom they should stand under. Ezra had to open their minds to a new way, which was in actuality an old way of understanding. So he brought the law before them, that they might understand. The ingredient of understanding of being in God's presence is like eggs. Eggs like minds must be opened to be of any use. 
Ezra was opening their mind to understanding. When we come before God's presence, it's helpful to have the ingredient of an open mind as well, so that we might understand. Eggs and minds must be open for there to be understanding. Understanding is our third ingredient. Our fourth ingredient is remorse. Remorse is the next component of being in God's presence. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 10 says, the people wept when they heard the law and were grieved. They were sad, remorseful, grieving. Why? Because they had heard the word it had been interpreted, and now they finally understood how far they had fallen from God's grace. Seventy years of exile had hidden from them how far off the mark they were in faithful living, of how far they had strayed from the covenants of their ancestors. Moses and those once enslaved in Egypt had made eternal promises to God. And now Ezra has told those who were once in exile in Babylon what God required. And so the people wept, grieving over the promises they had broken in Babylon. Now they knew what God wanted, and they freely wept. And for us, too, when we come before the presence of God, we weep. Weep over our lives and how far they have fallen from God's grace. Weep because of the promises we've made and broken. Weep because we understand what God requires and yet are unable to fulfill it. Remorse is the fourth ingredient. Remorse that comes in salty tears. Remorse is a salty ingredient for being in God's presence. Our fourth ingredient is remorse. Our fifth ingredient is rejoicing. Rejoicing is the fifth component of being in God's presence. Nehemiah 8, 12 and 10 says, They rejoiced because they understood the words, eat the fat and drink sweet wine. What an amazing turnaround. Did you catch it? They first understood and were remorseful. Now, just a few verses later, they understood the words and rejoiced. What happened? What turned their remorse to rejoicing? The reading tells us that Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the scribal priest, and the Levites all reassured the people. They told them that this was a holy day and that the Lord was joyful and the joy of the Lord would be their strength. News of God's grace turned it all around for the people. Although their first understanding was how far they'd fallen short, their second understanding was that despite everything, God still loved them, and was joyful for them, and would give them strength. This good news caused them to rejoice. For us who weep over our lives and how far we've fallen, God's always there to meet us with grace. For us who weep over the promises we've made and broken, 
There's a God whose promises to us are always kept. For us who weep because we understand what God requires and yet are unable to fulfill it, God provides grace beyond measure in Jesus who fulfills what we cannot. There is nothing you've done that God cannot forgive. No hurt in your life that God cannot heal. God loves you despite everything you've ever done and is joyful for you and will give you strength which is cause for great rejoicing. We see the ingredients for rejoicing in our text. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine. Fat was a symbol of blessing and something greatly to be desired. Sweet wine was the elixir of celebration. Fat, in our recipe, is to be found in butter. While what made the wine sweet was its sugar, another component of being in God's presence. Recipes usually only call for a pinch of salt, a, a bit of remorse, if you will, but liberal portions of butter and sugar, of sweet and fat. Our rejoicing friends should always outmeasure our remorse when in God's presence. Rejoicing is our fifth ingredient. We've assembled all our ingredients. Let's go over our recipe checklist. Take flour of people, baking powder of hearing and interpretation, eggs of understanding, a dash of salty remorse, liberal portions of rejoicing butter and sugar, and you mix it all together and it becomes a doughy sweet batter. Now before you get your beaters ready to lick, it's not yet a cake. We need some other things to complete our checklist for being in God's presence. Beyond ingredients, there are absolute necessities for having a birthday cake. The first necessity is a book, and not just any book, the Bible. Nehemiah 8.5 says, Ezra opened the book. He was standing above all the people. Ezra was standing above so that there might be understanding. He was reading from an elevated position representing the high esteem that the people of God had for the Word of God. Scholars think that today's story began the practice within Judaism of elevating the reading of Scripture so that all the people would stand under its authority. Whenever the scrolls of God's Word were unrolled and read, it was always done from an elevated position. I did some measurements in our sanctuary, found out something I hadn't realized before. I looked at the heights of various pieces of furniture on our elevated platform. Our communion table is 32 and a half inches in height. Interestingly enough, our keyboard is the exact same height. Our plexiglass lectern from which scripture is read is 43 and one half inches high, the highest piece of furniture on our platform. Now, out of curiosity, I measured the wooden pulpit from which I preach, and it's 45 and a fourth inches in height. I choose to preach at this level. I choose to preach at this level, 19 and one quarter inches below the lectern for a reason. And I want you to understand why. I stand under the authority of God's Word equally to you. And because I'm a teacher that's judged with greater strictness 
for the words that come from my mouth, and will, I will render an account to God according to James 3.1 and Hebrews 13.17. I choose carefully what I say. Many pastors, in an attempt to be hip and happening, rocking and rolling, relevant and relatable, will tell stories about themselves and their family as part of the sermon. The sermon becomes a series of illustrations and amusing anecdotes. I was standing in line at the checkout when, and I remember the time I got stuck with a chatty stranger on a three-hour flight. And as an example of Christian patience, let me exhibit my spouse to you. And in conclusion, let me tell you a heartwarming story about my child on our family vacation. And while the immediate impact of those human interest stories from the preacher is that congregants feel they can relate to their pastor, the long-term downside is that God gets pushed aside in the sermon and the pastor becomes the focal point of the message. In an effort to be entertaining, God gets edged out. The main character in the message becomes the minister and not the Almighty. My professor, David Buttrick, who literally wrote the book on preaching called Homiletic, researched the takeaway from such sermons and found that what congregants remembered was not the brilliant exposition of Scripture or the detailed analysis of doctrine, but the story the preacher told about themselves. Folks, if I'm doing my job right, I'm getting myself out of the way so that you can have an encounter with God's Word. It's why I don't share more about myself in the pulpit. Because frankly, this isn't the place. Because the message isn't about me. It's about God. I stand shoulder to shoulder with you at this level for a reason. Like Ezra, we too stand under the Bible. It's the highest worship spot in our sanctuary, which tells us that everything stands under it. Music, the Lord's Supper, and preaching, all are under its authority. Altitude makes a difference in elevating God's Word and in baking cakes. Altitude affects the end product of making cakes. It makes a difference whether you're baking a cake in Death Valley or on top of Mount McKinley. So the question Nehemiah poses for us today is this. What's the altitude of God's Word in your life? 280 feet below sea level or at 20,320 feet in the air? Because, friends, if you don't have the Bible, you can't really bake. You can't just pour wet dough into the oven and expect to get a cake. You need a structure, a form in which people can be shaped and molded. The Bible provides that structure, that form, that pan in which the dough of your life can be poured and shaped accordingly. That book, the Bible, is a necessity in preparing a cake. The next necessity, without which you don't get a cake at all, is God. Nehemiah 8, 6, and 10 says, They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This day is holy. The people have shown the right altitude with God's Word and now show the right attitude in being in God's presence. 
Not only is the day holy, but they're in the presence of the holy. So they bow their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. They worship, they reverence the God whose joy is their strength. They had heard the book of Moses, and now like Moses, they bow before God. So let's say you got your pan filled with sweet dough. You can mix together people, hearing and interpretation, understanding with remorse and rejoicing, even a Bible pan, but if you don't have God, you don't have anything but a doughy mess. It may be nice to lick off beaters, but you wouldn't dare serve it to anyone. What's the next necessity? Well, you need an oven, which thankfully the God of Moses provides in a burning bush. You need the fire of the Holy Spirit to give rise to greater understanding and leavening that only comes about through heat. God is the critical necessity without which you don't get a cake. God is more than an ingredient. God is a necessity whose fiery presence gives rise to birthday cakes. God is the next necessity. Final necessity is sharing. As one who has been in the presence of God knows, to be in God's presence invites sharing. As Nehemiah 8, 10, and 12 says, send portions for them for whom nothing is prepared and make great rejoicing. Ezra tells the people to send portions to those who have none and make great rejoicing. Folks, it's a party every week to be in the presence of the Lord. And we are blessed to be able to share in that rejoicing. I mean, folks, it's happening 24-7, whether we're aware of it or not. The angels in heaven, the cherubim, seraphim, and all the rest are celebrating, praising God without ending, moment by moment. And on Sundays, on Sundays, we get to join in that celebration. And we are blessed to be able to do it. After all, what's a birthday cake? for a solo person? What's a celebration for a party of one? A birthday cake by necessity is meant to be shared. And for birthday parties, the more the merrier. Good worship is like good cake. It invites sharing. Being in God's presence is sweeter than homemade birthday cakes. And when we bake a cake using these ingredients, It'll serve five or 5,000. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you are ready to join the celebration of what God's doing among us, we'd rejoice to share in that commitment and invite you forward as we sing, We Come as Guest Invited. Please stand as you're able.